am Beverly Guy Sheftall, and I am the Anna Julia Cooper Professor of Women's Studies at Spelman College. On behalf of the African American Policy Forum and the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies, I am delighted to act as a moderator for this engaging conversation with Black feminists, writers, scholars, and activists. All who have been pivotal in the articulation of the theory and praxis of Black feminism and intersectionality in the US and beyond. Today, on the third day of Her Dream Deferred, I am delighted to moderate a conversation with feminist sisters whom I have known and worked with for decades. We have worked together, struggled together for years, fighting against the erasure of Black women during the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill hearings, during the Million Man March, during the controversy over my brother's keeper. And now we come together again in the face of another moment in which Black women find themselves marginalized in matters pertaining to the African-American community, our history, our present, and our future. Today, a new and international generation of scholars and activists have come together to emphatically oppose the attacks being waged on educational curricula against intersectionality, critical race theory, black feminism, queer theory, and other frameworks that address structural inequalities. This attack has spread to 46 states in the union and have introduced or passed anti-CRT restrictions. It was in this political context that the College Board recently launched a new AP African American Studies course. This course was brought about by the demand that was generated by the racial reckoning of 2020, but it collided with the buzzsaw of anti-wokeness. Many of the key concepts identified as central to the course did not survive the collision. Instead of a course that fully embraced the rich and varied dimensions of African-American life, the College Board has offered a course that tracks exactly the excisions that the anti-woke cabal has legislated. Purged from the proposed curriculum is Black feminism, queer Black studies, and intersectionality. So the urgency of this situation is why, why we have brought this panel together. We will consider not only why Black feminist and Black queer scholarship has historically been targeted both from inside and from outside our communities, but why everyone who cares about our community should care about what is happening. Before us, generations of Black women fought and we must continue to fight because we know that the survival of Black life in the Americas and beyond that can never be taken for granted precisely because it is born of a Black feminist ethic of accountability, intimacy, and revolutionary love. I am delighted to welcome my panelists and friends into this conversation. Kathy J. Cohen is the David and Mary Winton Green Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. Kathy's work focuses on topics like the HIV AIDS epidemic, Black feminism and queer politics. Kathy is known for her seminal work, arguing for an intersectional approach to queer politics and organizing. She is a founding board member of the Audre Lord Project in New York City. Kimberly Crenshaw is the Isidore and Seville Sues Botcher Professor of Law at Columbia University, Distinguished Professor of Law and the Promise Institute Chair in Human Rights at UCLA, as well as the Executive Director of the African American Policy Forum and the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies. 
she coined the terms intersectionality and critical race theory. And finally, Evelyn Hammonds, who is the Barbara Gutman Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science, Professor of African and African American Studies, and Professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Harvard University. Evelyn's research focuses on topics like the HIV AIDS epidemic, as well as Black female sexuality. Moreover, her work focuses on the intersections between science and race in the medical profession. She is also the inaugural Audre Lorde Chair in Queer Studies at Spelman College. What we have seen with the most recent attacks on intersectionality and Black feminism is the ways that these ideas have been singled out by right-wing reactionaries, but also abetted by appeasers such as the college board to make these ideas seem fringe or marginal. I want to begin by exploring some of your initial reactions when you first heard about the college board, what the college board had done with its final iteration of the course. These edits, deletions, alterations were surgical and precise and changed the fundamental goals of the course. Looking at some of the ways that these things have happened. I want to start initially with you, Kim. What were some of your initial thoughts? <laughs> well, um, <coughs> Beverly, first, I'm really, really excited to have this conversation. As you said, we've all been in the trenches for decades now. Uh, I know we don't look it, but that's exactly <laughs> what's going on. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I first heard that uh, the course had been released without uh, intersectionality as one of the uh, required topics and Black feminism and uh, Black queer studies, all of which had been in the initial uh, framing of the course, um, I, I wasn't surprised because I had conversations uh, with various folks associated with the project in which they were trying to explain um, why this was an excision that that um, didn't really make a difference. So um, I was uh, disappointed, of course, um, that it had happened, uh, especially so uh, because in part what I thought that a decision signaled was that the right wing could successfully um, encourage us to distance ourselves in our education from some of the ideas that even people who were involved in creating the course thought were essential uh, to African-American studies. Now, what was um, uh, hard to believe was the claims that the College Board made that they didn't do it uh, because DeSantis uh, told them to, they didn't do it because anti-woke legislation, which had by that time crisscrossed the country, uh, had identified these ideas as um, ideas that they refused to allow their children to be exposed to. So what was odd to me about it was essentially a, a defense saying, we didn't do it because they told us to do it. We did it because we wanted to, which <laughs> I thought made the situation, you know, even worse. Um, at the end of the day, the smoking gun came a couple weeks after when the New York Times quoted one of the um, uh, one of the folks at College Board who says he was ultimate resp ultimately responsible for excising uh, some of the material and said that he had taken intersectionality out because it had been uh, deprived of all meaning. It had been you know, so politicized by the right that it was no longer a useful framework or a useful word. And to me, I, I thought who gave you or the college board the right to decide what black people um, should be exposed to, what concepts are important uh, in the understanding of the contemporary lives that we lead, who is the college board to make the, these decisions? So my, my 
my initial reaction was disappointment. My subsequent reaction was, who the who who do you think you are um, to decide the concepts and terms that people use uh, all over um, uh, the world and throughout uh, the African American diaspora should not be utilized because the right wing has decided to try to separate us from these ideas. So um, it's it's finally you know gotten my fight up. Kathy, what were your thoughts when you heard that your work had been targeted for removal? Well, you know, I had multiple responses, I think, similar to Kim. Uh, first was that if we understand the College Board and AP courses as money-making endeavors, right, uh, meant to speak to a consumer base, at some level, it's not surprised that if part of that consumer base, at least as, as it's been represented, says no to certain content, that to protect their kind of profit margin, that is the nature of capitalism, right, and racial capitalism, uh, the college board would say, let's take this out, right? Um, so at some level, I wasn't surprised, but I think like many of us, and maybe most of us, I was disgusted, right? because I know the centrality of not just a history, but ideas, and I would say radical thinking and the work of intersectionality and black feminism and black queer uh, studies to kind of reimagine and recenter who is the subject matter, right? The normative subject when we're thinking about black communities. I know how important that work is to telling a different type of story uh, or creating a narrative or an analysis about Black people and, and our existence and, and resistance. So disgusted, but not surprised. But I've also kind of been thinking about kind of the responses that I've received, right, to, to being a part of the list, we'll call it. Um, <laughs> and there have been kind of two major ways in which I've experienced this. One has been the incredible silence um, from entities that would profess to be defenders of free speech. I happen mm -hmm. to be employed and teach at one of those institutions, the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. who sees itself, right, at the forefront of institutions defending free speech. There is a faculty group called Chicago Free. The president just announced an institute for free speech. But yet there has been no mention, right, of the AP course and the kind of expansion of a censorship around a certain type of knowledge production that centers Black people from an analysis that really is about kind of empowerment, resistance, mobilization, and maybe even revolutionary thought, right, and practice. So, so one position and response that I've been kind of, I wouldn't say fascinated with, but interested in is the silence, the silence from many of the institutions where we teach uh, mm -hmm. A silence from foundations that profess to be like mm -hmm. invested in diversity and equity and inclusion, the silence from disciplinary um, institutions, right, whether it's the political science association or the sociologists or whomever you might identify, there hasn't been an uptake of this to say, no, we will not stand by while, you know, while this goes on. And part of this is about, you know, clearly for us, the difference between what is diversity work and what is an intellectual project that's about mm -hmm. uplifting and centering Black people. Diversity work is about mm -hmm. having brown and Black bodies, and we don't really care about the kind of political and intellectual work of those bodies. We just want them uh, there. So mm -hmm. silence. The other, uh, very quick, the other kind of response I've gotten is a kind of sincere, let's start with congratulations that people will tell me like, <laughs> I can't believe you're on that list. I'm so happy to know you because know you you're on that list. And I don't want to, I don't want to belittle at all people's <laughs> kind of extending what I believe uh, they understand as support, right? Mm -hmm. But there is this kind of feeling of a kind of proximity to danger, right? Like they mm -hmm. weren't targeted, but I know somebody who was targeted. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, I worry sometimes when, when I hear people kind of take that stance, and again, I appreciate the support, that we're not fully grasping what this type of 
censorship is meant to do, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like about my article or any of our articles. It really is about a silencing, a limiting of the story that we tell about the nature of white supremacy in this country, the continued mm -hmm. reduction of white supremacy, the kind of uh, the fantasy, or not fantasy, I will say, um, the belief in white vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the need to protect white vulnerability mm -hmm. and, and what that means in terms of what we will then allow largely white students to be taught and to learn, right? So, mm -hmm. so I, you know, in many ways, I think we would probably all agree we're not surprised, mm -hmm. um, but it should hopefully mobilize all of us to understand the kind of larger context in which this is happening and to mobilize people to respond. Right. All right. Uh, Evelyn, what are some of the ways in which some of your colleagues and partners have reacted to this repressive moment? And were you surprised by any of these reactions? I was, I was absolutely not surprised. I think the silence has been deafening as I think we all agree. Uh, the people that I expected to speak out vigorously uh, um, with you know, loud voices, uh, as Kathy already noted, leading uh, leaders of, of many of the major foundations that supported uh, the, the work uh, that was uh, excised from the AP uh, uh, course, uh, haven't said very much. Um, colleagues that I expected to uh, have a, a, be able to mount a serious critique and vigorous opposition to these, to this, these practices didn't say a word. And so that to me has been quite striking and shocking. I have been teaching about intersectionality, black feminism, uh, gay and lesbian studies, black queer studies for over 30 years. And there is no way to teach about uh, the issues that they list in the, in, in the AP course as something that should be important. And one example they had is said uh, major social movements. And I'm thinking, what possible major social movements in the United States could they be talking about and not talk about intersectionality and not talk about how different groups were marginalized within those social movements? If we talk about the abolitionist movement in the 19th century, we could talk about labor movements from the late 19th century through the early 20th century. We could talk about the broader civil rights movement. We could talk about women's movements to, to earn the right to vote. In which of those movements are issues of the intersection of race, gender, class, and sexuality have no import? So what they've done is with precision and with intentionality is remove from this course any kind of, of, of ability for the teachers who will be teaching it and for the students who will be hearing about it, any point to how do you understand these movements and all the diverse peoples who fought for their rights and expansion of, of, of rights in the United States, how they came to do it and on what terms. So if you can't do that, I have no idea what they're talking about when they say uh, black women's leadership. What does that mean? Black women's leadership over the long history of this country occur in a context where they would be denied access to the vote, to bodily autonomy, to reproductive justice, all of these things. So what, what would you be talking about if you're not talking about the very things that they deliberately and intentionally removed? So I have been, I, I, I see it as a way not just to uh, ignore certain aspects as they've tried to get us to believe in their public statements, but actually to take away the real honest context in which all of these issues emerge. And so to not provide students and teachers any way to analyze the very topics that they keep, they point it to as they quote, I would say sort of defamed those subjects. And so for me, it has been one of the most shocking moments that I can remember in, 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 my, in my academic and, and in my personal life. Um, because I just don't understand uh, the intent uh, behind this. 
I should say this differently. I understand the intent behind this. <laughs> and the intent behind this is to not tell the truth about American history. And as a historian, as a feminist, as a person who's been an activist in LGBTQ rights and queer studies, I, you know, I understand what they're doing. It's, about, it's, a, it's another moment to silence issues that bring to the fore the real context of what has happened in, in the United States over, this, over our long history. And it's one more attempt to restrict the rights of the very people they've identified uh, and groups that we've supported all of our lives uh, so that we don't have a voice. And not only now, we don't have a voice, we don't have a history. We have no history. And I think that is, um, that is really seriously, um, um, I guess I would say the only thing that I, I, I am surprised about is really the silence of, of, of uh, allies who I would have expected to be right here on the front lines with us in conversations uh, that would have been on the front pages of every major publication, all social media for the last months that this, this report has been released. That's what I'm shocked about most of all. And for me, it's personally a moment of renewal. Well, you, it, I have, I, I have, never stop teaching these issues. I'm not going to stop now. I don't know what's going to happen. I am privileged, like all of us, to be in an elite institution where tenure supposedly guarantees my right to teach this material. And we'll see if that's still going to hold up as well. You are certainly right. As Black feminists, probably this should not have surprised us too much. In many respects, of course, Black feminism has long had to fight itself into most of the disciplines in m many academic contexts. The notion that it can be dispensed with obviously follows from the suspicion that it has long been met with. Not only does this situation now have historical precedents, we have seen the ways in which black women have been erased by gender blind racial discourse and colorblind gender discourse. When we think back, for example, to 1991, one of the first moments we collectively organized and a landmark moment for Black feminism was, of course, back in 1991. We were all involved in the decision by nearly 1,600 women to sign up to a letter defending Anita Hill and denouncing Clarence Thomas in his quest to be on the Supreme Court. I want to invite our viewers to take a trip with us down memory lane to that moment when we came together as African-American women in defense of ourselves. Evelyn, you may remember we were reflecting on that moment a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. What were some of the reactions to Anita Hill's testimony that we were up against? And what resonances does it now have for the ways in which Black women are being targeted yet again? So, so what was so shocking in, 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 in the moment of Anita Hill's testimony uh, was her, you know, she, she, she had such uh, uh, inner spirit, the truthfulness of her, of her statements were so, so evident. Uh, and so I was, you know, as everyone was riveted by her testimony, but the, the, within minutes, many of the uh, black men that I knew were calling uh, and saying, oh my God, how could she have done this? How could she have said that? And she was within minutes turned into some kind of race traitor. How can she say this about him? Well, you know, he couldn't have, it couldn't have been that bad. Even my own father was saying, you know, I, I don't, she should have never said any of those things because the brother is going to get into the Supreme Court and he's going to do the right thing for black people once he gets in there. We don't have to worry about that. She shouldn't have said any of these things. And my father and I d debated this for years. Many of my colleagues and, 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 and much younger men of my own age at the time were also uh, really f with vigorous uh, and vehemence saying that a black woman should never tell her truth against a black man in a setting like the US Senate. And so it was a moment where I thought, wait a minute, I thought we had come a long way here. I thought we had understood um, in black communities across this nation that you know race and gender matter, that black women did suffer 
at the hands of some black men. And that that wasn't an indictment of the entire race, but that it was an important and necessary kinds of truth to be told. That is not what was happening. We came up against vigorous, vigorous opposition to uh, gathering the names for uh, African-American women in defense of ourselves. We came up against opposition for publishing it, getting it published in the New York Times. And I think it was a moment of a real breach between Black men and Black women, um, those of us in the academy for sure, in terms of, of whether Black men were actually going to support Black women telling the truth about their lives. Kathy, uh, what would you say are the connections between the ways Black women have long had to stand up for ourselves that actually led to the development of knowledge frameworks related to Black feminism, intersectionality, and Black queer studies? Oh, there's so many connections. Um, but let me, let me start by saying, I remember watching the hearings as I was writing a dissertation on HIV and uh, AIDS in Black communities. Well, yeah. Um, and there was a recognition as I watched uh, with the material I was trying to think through in the dissertation. And in the dissertation, it was about the ways in which Black communities, um, at times, I think, out of an intentionality that was about protection, right? We have to. We have to conform to a certain type of normative understanding so that white people will respect us. Mm -hmm. At times about an effort to protect a kind of black masculinity. Um, at times, at, at moments, uh, in an attempt to kind of control and protect black institutions like the black church. But there was a way in which black, in particular black gay men were being written out of blackness, right? They didn't conform. They didn't have the same type of masculinity. It's about, you know, when there wasn't any like gay stuff back in Africa. I mean, the, the things that were said about how we will determine who is black, right? The social construction of blackness was right there in, in view for us. And I think with, with Anita Hill, we saw a parallel, right? Deconstruction of her blackness, right? Mm -hmm. She dared to air her dirty laundry to the kind of white gaze, right? To a white audience. Um, the tropes, the white supremacist tropes about black women were told in this case, not only by white men, but also by black men, right? Mm -hmm. She was somehow defined outside of blackness in the same way that for me, these black gay men who were struggling around, uh, against HIV and AIDS um, were also written out of blackness. And so I think, mm -hmm. There is a, a, there's a way in which this moment, we are reminded of the many, many sites of power, right? Mm -hmm. There is, of course, one way we can talk about power, which is about kind of the power that's located in white communities and white institutions and white supremacy. But we also have to kind of take note, and I think this is what Anita Hill's, uh, I guess, moment does for us. It reminds us of the ways in which there are, are also, we also have power within Black communities, right? to shame, to dismantle, um, to uh, kind of deconstruct, right? The ways in which we're located, the communities to which we feel connected. I remember uh, in one of Kim's pieces where she talks about the difficulty of home, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that is what we saw. And then, so it says to us, what has to be the response? Well, the response has to be that those who are marginalized, those who are being def defined as somehow outside of blackness have to come together, work collaboratively and demand a more expansive and capacious understanding of who is black and what is right. black, about the ways in which power functions in our communities and outside of our communities. And I think that's what, you know, that's what that Anita Hill, and I don't wanna call it a moment or a movement, that's what it does for us, right? It, it reminds us of the struggles that we have both outside and inside of communities and the ways in which we came together, right, under a we do. And so I just wanna raise three names, Deborah King, Elsa Barkley Brown, Barbara Rans, yes. who yes. kind of led that effort for us. And yes. we watched as more yes. and more black women, more and more black women who called themselves feminists and some who didn't said, 
I've got to speak up, right? Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I think that is another moment of where we see Black feminist mobilization. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a reminder really of the complexity of Black communities, the complexity of power and the kind of power and resistance that, that gets, gets revealed when you take a Black feminist framework. And I think that's the same type of power and resistance and revealing that the College Board was trying to, trying mm -hmm. to so Kim, what is the cautionary tale that we learned from African-American women in defense of ourselves? And what did that saga that we found ourselves in, uh, what does that say about now when the college board has the nerve to say that we can have a course on African-American studies without any serious engagement with intersectionality and black feminism? <laughs> You know, um, I, I, there, there are a couple moments in, in my lifetime that I count as before and after. Uh, the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill was a before and after moment, right? Before that happened, um, I, I, I had this belief that the patriarchy, the sexism that we tolerate in our community, um, you know, we, we, we could deal with it uh, without uh, fundamentally breaking with some of those assumptions that we could work it out in the end when we were able to show the importance of having a gendered um, a framework to, to understand what our community's interests are. Um, after that, um, I didn't believe that anymore. And, and some of what broke that belief was actually, first of all, seeing so many Black people, Black women in particular, come to the Capitol during the time that we were there fighting for Anita Hill, fighting for civil rights, fighting for a future that uh, Thurgood Marshall had spent his lifetime trying to create. Seeing Black women come to the Capitol um, to pray for Clarence Thomas, to sing spirituals for Clarence Thomas, to call Anita Hill all out of her name. Um, just seeing what asymmetric solidarity looks like um, broke something in me. I, I couldn't go back to those fantasies. And if seeing it wasn't enough, um, understanding how these um, failures came from incomplete histories that were not being told um, made me even more committed to not silencing the histories of Black women. So one of the things that got said um, about Anita Hill, it was, it was said by Orlando Patterson in, in the pages of the New York Times, of all the op-eds they got, the, the one that they decided to print was this one. And in this op-ed, he basically said that even if Anita was telling the truth about everything that happened. She was effectively still lying because she was taking something that carried no cultural opprobrium in our community that was purely accepted as down home courting and, and throwing it in the overheated terrain of basically how white women think about sex and sexuality. So it was basically saying this whole sexual harassment thing is a white woman's thing. It's not, it's yes. not one of our things, right? right. Right. Now, why was he able to say that? And why were so many Black people prepared to believe it when, in fact, Black women were the main plaintiffs of sexual harassment <laughs> cases? It yes. was our experience that allowed us to see that sexual abuse at work was not misplaced dating, but it was part of misogynoir, it was part of sexism, it was patriarchy, and it was racism. That was us. We were the ones that brought that to the table. And the fact that our people didn't know it is simply the product of consistently marginalizing Black women's experience with racism. And when Black women do show up, they show up shorn of the context out of which they came to their political awareness. So when we think about Rosa Parks, we think about her feet being tired. <laughs> we don't think about the fact that she was a rape crisis advocate for Reese Taylor long before she sat on that bus. That part of her history, that just got erased. So it was an erasure that ill-prepared Black people to fight back against the 
erasure of Anita Hill fight back against the use of high tech lynching by Clarence Thomas to make him seem as though he was a subject of something that we all should care about and, and place her on the outs. It was bad enough that the erasure history had that impact at that moment. But if you look to see what our support of Clarence Thomas produced over the next 30 years, he was the fifth vote that undermined virtually every part of the civil rights infrastructure from the Voting Rights Act, which has been completely gutted, which is why we have these legislatures doing the crazy things that they're doing, the undermining of campaign finance reform, he gave us Bush versus Gore. Mm -hmm. Now if we go back and erase that 5-4 majority and rethink what life might've looked like if we've been able to stand up for Anita Hill, we would be in a different country right now. Mm -hmm. So the erasure of black women's history not only impacts black women and not only impacts the black community, it impacts the nation. So when you ask like now, what does this mean? One thing I gotta give the right wing, they know what to go after, right? They don't go after stuff that doesn't count. Mm -hmm. They go after the stuff that counts. So mm -hmm. yeah, they're gonna go after black feminism. They're gonna go after intersectionality. They're gonna go after black queer studies because we know through that lens, we can see all of the ways that our democracy is at stake right now. And the best way to understand how fascism is gonna happen in this country is through the road paved by white supremacy. So these are the tools that allow us to see what is coming at us. And it's exactly why they wanna take them out. And it's exactly why it's a travesty that anyone who cares about us or our nation would allow it to happen. Do we get to say amen? Yes. I was going to say amen and a woman too. A woman. Yes, yes, yes. Something yes. like that. Absolutely. Uh, Kathy, in, in the wake of, of College Board's uh, disastrous decision, there are actually people out there who believe that any old African-American studies course is better than none. <laughs> this, you know, we don't care what it looks like. We're just glad to have it. As such, some would argue that describing conditions is enough, that we don't really need concepts. So tell our audience what is lost when concepts like Black feminism, Black queer studies, intersectionality are actually purged. Right, right. Um, so we would start, I think, by saying details are important. History is important. History tells a story. And it's critical because it lays the groundwork to me for an analysis. And I think that is in fact what black feminism, black queer studies or black queer theory provides us, right? Um, it is not only kind of who is included in the history, the telling of our story, but it tells us about how we understand the mechanisms, the structures, the policies that lead to outcomes. What do I mean by that? And I, I'm sure everybody watching understands this already, but if we take something like um, racial inequality, right, there are multiple ways of explaining that, right? You can, we can tell a history of racial inequality without the analysis, but one analysis would say, in fact, that black people suffer um, because in fact, they make bad decisions, right? That is about poor culture that, uh, we you know, don't have the same normative or the right norms. We are prone to thinking about enjoyment and not thinking about you know, the long-term. There's another analysis that says, in fact, that there is no way to understand racial inequality without understanding the kind of structural racism that exists in this culture, in this country and this culture, right? That we can't understand housing inequality without understanding both the explicit and implicit ways that the FHA or the uh, VA allowed certain groups of white people to have access to supports and mortgages when in fact they denied those either explicitly or implicitly to black people, right? It is the difference in terms of how we understand the historical narrative that or the historical story that we're telling. Black feminism 
I would argue, in intersectionality and Black queer studies, right? It, it provides an analysis, of it, but it provides an analysis, I often argue, from the margins to the center, or as bell hooks would have said, mm -hmm. bell hooks from the margins to the center, right? It takes those who are often most marginal, whether they are those who identify as women, those who are identify as non-binary, um, those who identify as LGBT and queer, right? And says, if we center you, it allows us to understand a different way in which society has operated, in which uh, Black communities have operated. It allows us, as we talked before, to think differently about where are the kind of points and what does power look like in our communities? How do we understand the ways in which racial capitalism uh, emerges and exists in Black communities, right? So to say that we want a Black studies course is true. We do want young Black people and older Black people to be exposed to the centrality of Black people to, as Kim just talked about, the democracy, right? Um, the ways in which this country is structured and functions, but we want something that is accurate and complex and nuanced, right? That tells a true story. See, this is the thing, a true story mm -hmm. about the kind of history, mm -hmm. the current mm -hmm. moment and the future prospects, in particular mm -hmm. for those who are most marginal, because by understanding those who are most marginal, we actually understand uh, the larger society and the, and the country. So I think it is a mistake, right? And I think we all do to say that any history is okay, that any African-American right. studies is okay. Because what we will get is an African-American studies that writes out the complexity, that writes out not just resilience, but resistance, that writes right. out the ways in which black people have mobilized, right? To move democracy in mm -hmm. this country um, mm -hmm. in a way that we often don't get that story. And in, instead the kind of vulnerable subjects and a different type of history become white people who are thought to be losing their country and therefore have to be protected by telling a certain type of history, by protecting a certain type of white student. Um, and that denies right the ways in which benefits, privileges get reproduced. So when people say, mm -hmm. I didn't own any slaves, but you do own the, the privilege that came from somebody in your community mm -hmm. and somebody in your race right. from owning slaves, right? So. Yeah. We want complexity, we want truth, we want a story and a history and an analysis that centers on those who are most marginal and the ways in which they have reimagined what is possible and the ways in which they've mobilized to produce uh, all the advances that in fact we benefit from. But I, can I just add one more thing to what Kathy just said? And I, I yes. agree completely with what you just said. <laughs> but, but the other part of it is without the vantage point that we get from black feminists, from uh, queer people, from queer black folks, uh, and from black studies in general, is a story that says everything in America is fine now. All of those problems we have with those people mm -hmm. are in the past. We've had a black president, we have a black vice president, everything's fine. And so if there's anything wrong now, it's people who don't want to take advantage of all the things that America has to offer. And therefore they don't need to be here if they don't want to believe in the America that we believe in. So it's a way to say, so what they're up to again, is a way to say that uh, we've come through all of these problems. Therefore we do not need to teach our, our, our children about them because we now have this place that's you know almost colorblind, almost a level playing field and now we need to write it just the tilt the, the balance has gone too far to to thinking about the issues raised by these these black folks who are doing just fine and the ones who aren't doing just fine are just those people don't have the will or the courage or the ability to take advantage of all the wonderful things america has to offer so they want to make us believe a story that all the great fights and challenges that we have made to expand democracy in this country are not needed. They, that, that, that this is all, this is all done. And, and I think that's one of the more insidious aspects of what they've been up to lately. 
Let, let, and, and let me get in on this too, because okay. and, amen, amen, and like, and another thing, you know, so while we're at it, you know, um, one of the things that got said by the college board that goes to um, the, the question you asked earlier, Beverly, like, you know, it, it's a course with just the facts. Um, mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. do things. We mm -hmm. don't. So the justification for taking all this stuff out. <laughs> that, well, what you guys do is, is theory and it's speculative and it's, it is in, in, and from the right wing, it's indoctrination, right? So mm -hmm. we've got to take that out and, and just offer up the course. Now, there is a theory that holds black studies together. The theory is that white supremacy is wrong. That's the theory. <laughs> <laughs> That's a theory. Yes. People can disagree yes. with it, but that's a theory. The theory is Black people are human. People disagree with it. Still mm -hmm. do. Right. right? Right. But there is a commitment that African American studies makes, and it organizes its material to illustrate those commitments. Now, obviously, those who don't share that commitment see the course as counter to their view and indoctrination. Taking these theoretical, these commitments out doesn't make a non-indoctrination course. It just indoctrinates people to the opposite point of view, mm, right? Because it's not as though people will look around at all the inequality and just have no position on it or no story that they have access to to explain it. Kathy laid out exactly what people will infer if they don't have an understanding, an explanation about why our housing stock looks the way it does, why we live where we do, why our health looks like it is. If you don't get exposed to what makes these facts, the facts that they are, then you will infer, interpret all sorts of things that the culture is there and ready to give to you. So Black studies, African-American studies from the very beginning was organized around the pursuit of the explanation for the, de the deprivation of our humanity mm -hmm. and providing that for our young people, for our entire community. So yes, there is a project and the college board doesn't get to decide that we're gonna take this project away from Black people mm -hmm. and substitute something that's going to be acceptable to the neo Confederate faction of the United States. That's what's happened. They have stripped this asset from us and given us something else right. and expect us to be happy about it. Thank God a lot of us are not happy about it. Can I jump in one more time? Well, one more. <laughs> and then, and then, yes, I'll say amen. Which is, I think there's even a bigger problem that the college, I don't know if it's the college board or who's trying to address this, but I think there is a way in which white people have seen their living standards decrease, their you know, um, expectation for life expectancy decrease. And here's the thing, black studies can also, a complicated, Black feminist, Black studies can explain to young white people, right, mm -hmm. the work of capitalism and racial capitalism and the right. way it also truncates their possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the real, it's not even just about telling our truth, is mm -hmm. that our truth actually can radicalize these young white people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that instead of kind of giving them a true analysis, right, of the condition of poor people, and I'm not equating black poor people and white poor, but poor people, mm -hmm. in, right? Um, they'd rather kind of manipulate the idea of, I, I call it all the time, kind of white vulnerability right. to a point where the what you have to worry about is not capitalism, mm -hmm. but black people, right? Mm -hmm. And their, mm -hmm. their insistence on telling some historical story of being wrong where they're blaming you. And the truth is the most complicated and sophisticated and insightful black studies is not focused on an individual, but the structural racism that continues right. to repeat. 
manifest itself and harm not only black people but white people yeah. y'all are hot tonight <laughs> uh, Ellen, many people believe that knowledge like black feminism is only relevant to the humanities and and maybe the social sciences but as a scientist and engineer why is this knowledge also relevant even to stem or the hard sciences mm -hmm. it's relevant because uh what has emerged in this country in a very deliberate way is the uh, exclusion of, of uh, African Americans and other native born minorities is the term that I use in the scientific and technical enterprise. And so that enterprise is solely focused on the questions that largely white male scientists and now increasingly no numbers of white female scientists and engineers want to focus on. And those questions that they want to solve, the big technical scientific questions of the day do not relate to the lived experience of many of uh, uh, native born minorities, minority folks in this country. And so, uh, and the way it's taught, these, these, these science and engineering are taught in this country is to absolutely separate it from the social context. And the story that I tell is when I took my first science studies class at, uh, at Georgia Tech, and I just named it because that's where it was. Uh, and we had, a, I was in a project on solar engineering. And it was very early days on, the, on this technology. I was the only African-American, only female in my class. And I had an idea that we could put solar panels on the top of, of, of uh, buildings in low income housing projects. And in particular in Atlanta, because those buildings have flat roofs. And I thought, well, what better place to put these solar panels? And then these people who had uh, uh, low incomes could have a cheaper heat and maybe even air conditioning as well based on the use of solar power. So that was my project. The class had to grade each person's project and they gave me an F. They said, no, we cannot put our sophisticated equipment with those people. And I thought, those people? Wow, <laughs> right? And so my teachers called me in later and said, oh, no, 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 that was wrong. You're gonna get an A, that was a very good project. And, and they asked the students to, to um, apologize. And the students said, uh, you know, well, we like Evelyn, but you can't, you just can't put our sophisticated equipment in the hands of those people, meaning the black, the black people in Atlanta who lived in, in the area I was talking about was an uh, old uh, neighborhood of, of, uh, low, of housing projects. And they said they just couldn't put the, their equipment in the, in the hands of those people. And that was for me the really defining moment that this is not about objective understanding of how to create greater power for more people and access to, to, to power for heating and cooling that would serve all, all folks. This was as raced as anything that I had read in, his, in my history classes, that these engineers who were white men overwhelmingly saw these tools that they were creating as theirs and that they should be put in the service of their interests and nobody else's. And that's what the underrepresentation of, um, of uh, uh, black and brown folks uh, and other folks in the scientific and technical workforce in this country has produced. They produce tools that serve a certain segment of this country and not tools that improve the quality of life for all people. And so again, for me, a black feminist lens, I'm, I'm like, what do you mean those people? What do you mean we're not trying to do things that uh, 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 lessen the burden of women who do work in, 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 in as domestics or people who have to still uh, deal with water that's contaminated and they don't have any way to address those issues of contamination because they're considered the users of the technology and the science, but not the creators of it. And the creators of it, largely white men, believe they own this. They own the developments, the innovations, all of this. And so the, discrimin the discriminatory and exclusive practices that have limited the diversity of our scientific and technical workforce is as raced and racist in many instances as in any other professions you can think about in this country. And I think now we've divided up the world into creators who are largely white and users who are largely not white in this country. And in that sense, we're gonna, we have to use the tools they give us largely in the ways that they determine the, the tools should work. And they do not work in the service, as I said, of really um, improving the lives of many, many people. So, so I don't, I've never seen a division 
between the humanities uh, and the science and, and technical uh, engineering kinds of courses that I also took in, in my, in my uh, academic um, education. And I see a way in which those also, those, um, those areas of study are very carefully created to not allow much social context to enter into required courses. So those students who take those courses and overwhelmingly more and more students are encouraged to take those courses, don't learn any history. Don't learn any history of their own work that they are asked to study. And once you're gonna go into a world where you don't know your history, to me, that's walking into a world where many, many people are gonna be disenfranchised and most of those people will be disenfranchised will be uh, people of color in this country. And so, uh, you know, I, I sometimes I feel like I'm, uh, I'm standing in the wilderness, wilderness on this story, but it is going to become increasingly, and it has already become increasingly important. And the last thing I'll say about it, as a as a as, as a black, um, a queer feminist, is this: I still meet young uh, African American women in, who go to engineering schools and all these different programs that have opened up to them, and who are who are the only ones in their class who are never given an opportunity to express their own opinion or their own creativity and their own interest in using their, their mathematical and scientific talent to actually solve the problems that matter to them. They are silenced and they're silenced often. And it, it, so it, I, it's very disturbing to me that over 30 years, we still, students still experience this and particularly uh, women of color in these fields. So Kim, what are some of the costs? Because we'd be here all night if we talked about all of them. What are some of the costs of adopting a strategy, a strategy of appeasement to these forces, not just the college board, but all of them? What does our history tell us when we remain silent or pretend we aren't seeing what we're seeing? Yeah. Well, you know, one, one of the costs that, that's just concrete that comes directly from uh, what Evelyn just said. So one of one of the places and ways that this attack on so-called wokeness is showing up um, is in medical schools. Um, as we know, um, black folk do not have the same health outcomes as white folks. And a large part of it has to do with the medical profession itself. Um, at long last, in part because of awareness that has finally uh, been brought to things like maternal mortality, um, uh, the, the failure to uh, adequately ma uh, manage Black pain, um, the disproportionate death from uh, COVID in the, the initial months. There's finally been an effort to examine and interrogate the ways that medical practice, which is part of the science field uh, is not scientific, right? It's, it's embedded in the culture as the practice of law is. This is finally starting to trickle into med schools. And now there are organizations that are fighting against this, calling this wokeism, calling this reverse discrimination. So our lives are literally on the line here. This isn't just about you know, um, what books get read. It's about what treatment Black people um, uh, are, are going to get from institutions that have never, ever put the welfare and well-being uh, of Black people in their calculus. So, so we have real threats that are happening, and we have, at the same time, efforts to render us um, unable to speak the reality, unable to fully understand the contours. And when you can't speak something, you can't change anything. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's the end of the story, right? So the ideas and the experience is that um, this repression of, 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 of the full template of Black studies um, is about, it, it, it's about actually preventing us from interrogating and changing the, 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 the terms of our lives. So we know that that is the strategy of the right wing. We know this is red meat. Um, to to a neo nationalist uh, white base, but what is more, I guess, troubling is the extent to which mainstream um, 
institutions that consider themselves to be, you know, liberal um, have actually facilitated this. The right wing could not be successful if it weren't for a media that amplified their distortions in the <coughs> and institutions like the College Board, which as Kathy said at the very beginning, um, look at their market and, and say, hey, um, you know, the market, which has now been dictated by these anti-woke uh, forces um, have basically changed the, 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 the rules of the game. So either we're gonna stand up um, for what we claim our values are, and we might have to take a hit, or we're gonna just go with the program because the program has now been taken over by an anti-democratic racist faction in American society. Well, the choice seems to be among some of these folks to go with the anti-democratic racist faction in order to continue to make the Benjamins. So the challenge for us is to, to increase the cost of that appeasement. That's, that's the only way the segregation broke down because let's face it, most companies that operated in the South were willing to go along with segregation, not necessarily because of personal preference, but because it was costly for them not to do it until mm -hmm. civil rights activists, till the media, till politicians and to the world said, no, we're gonna increase the cost for you to deprive people of their basic civil and human rights. That's what we're up against right now, right? Unless we change the equation on the ground, unless we say we're not gonna allow appeasement, unless we call out those who are willing to allow it to happen, the same thing's gonna happen to us now that happened to us at the end of the 19th century, in which the idea was, you know what? We're not gonna keep pressing for equal rights. We're going to abide by redemption. We're going to let white people push us back. And we're going to let our former allies sit around and let it happen. We know the end of that story. Right. That's the point of Black studies. We know that direction. Question is whether we have the support, whether we have the determination and the commitment to tell a different story. Kathy, one of the responses from the college board to their censoring of Black queer studies in the curriculum was for them to point to figures such as Byatt Rustin and Audre Lorde, <laughs> who are, they say, taught in different parts of the course as proof that Black queer people are still being taught. We have a slide that shows the change from <laughs> queer studies to simply Black LGBTQ people. Why is it a negation of some of the scholarship you have pioneered, as well as Evelyn, and the whole field of Black queer studies reduced simply to the individual identities of figures taught in the course? Right. Um, you know, I think for people who aren't immersed in thinking about queer studies, especially as it uh, is practiced and thought and researched by uh, scholars of color, by Black scholars, you hear queer and you think of it as a short term for LGBT or lesbian right. gay. And then, you, you know, people do what I think is even worse, which is to start equating people who they understand to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender as queer. Mm -hmm. um, so we hear, you know, well, all, the reason we have to have uh, queerness in the college for curriculum it's because Audre Lorde was queer and you mm -hmm. don't uh, <laughs> her. So I think it misrepresents the field of work thinking about queer. That is one component mm -hmm. and we can contest or discuss or debate if that's the main focus, but really kind of a focus on queerness is really thinking about one's relationship, or at least for me and my work, is one's relationship to power in particular yes. state power it yes. is left a, less about an identity and more about a basis mm -hmm. of solidarity, right? It mm -hmm. is to say, what does it mean to be an outsider, to be mm -hmm. quote unquote queered? And can we see a process of queering happening with lots of people? Are mm -hmm. you queer or are you outside of state power 
if you are on welfare? Are you outside mm -hmm. of state power if in fact you before, you know, before marriage, right? You you couldn't have your relationships recognized, right? Are you outside of state power if in fact you're thought to be a poor trans person who doesn't deserve standing both relative to the state and relative to your community, right? And so what the college board has done is to not understand the kind of deep research and analysis <laughs> that has gone into thinking about a queer of color critique, right? By Rob mm -hmm. Ferguson or the incredible mm -hmm. work that E. Patrick Johnson has done to kind of mm -hmm. help seed a field or Evelyn has done and work that mm -hmm. I've done and, and many, many more. There is a, you know, an incredible literature, a rich literature that is thinking about blackness and queerness, right? The intersection mm -hmm. of those. And it's not about just a sexual identity. It is right. a political practice. It is a relationship to power. And it is a kind of uh, the formation of political solidarity that allows mm -hmm. people to mobilize. So, mm -hmm. so it's dangerous, first of all, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The college board <laughs> tries to equate that type of analysis and research by saying we've included these people <laughs> in on the curriculum. So mm -hmm. therefore we've dealt with that queer thing, right? And, yep. and the, the second thing I'll just say really quickly is I think part of the reason to highlight queer um, is it is thought to be a kind of red flag for people to suggest, yeah. look, there's this basically this crazy shit on this. Right, uh, right, <laughs> right. 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 Like, right. Like you don't want your children learning <laughs> about queer. What the hell does that mean, right? So, <laughs> so it does some really easy work for them to say that mm -hmm. this curriculum is dangerous and that these people mm -hmm. who are insisting on some type of kind of queer studies, you know, that they in fact don't reflect how you think about black people, black studies, black history. And if we look at DeSantis, when he was really pushed on why did you do this, the first place he turned was, there's this black queer studies stuff. Yes, exactly. so, you know, it, it, it was the easy picking. So right. you know, we've got to be more sophisticated um, in terms of making our case about one, what do we mean by queer? Why is it essential to understanding the complexity of black people? And why is it also an important framework through which we can understand and help to kind of uh, produce a type of mobilization and resistance that is at the center of a kind of radical black studies that you find with black feminism and intersectionality. So I'll stop. And it's another yeah. aspect, a tool, it's another tool for, for, for everybody to understand structures of power in this country. And, and, you know, because it's just another instantiation. I mean, queer studies reveals another instantiation of the practices of othering, practices of, of um, uh, not allowing full citizenship to, to individuals in this country because of their quote unquote identities or their practices or these kinds of things that, that continue to happen. This one's the easy one. DeSantis made it look really cheap and silly. Um, but again, what he's really after is he doesn't want he doesn't want students to understand how power works in this country and the deep deep biases built into it. Evelyn, before I ask, ask you the next question, I have to say how happy we are that you are the inaugural <laughs> chair in queer studies at Spelman College. I have to say, well, uh, I am I I am honored and humbled every single day. I I, I am I, Audrey Lord is hero, heroine of mine. It is, it is, a, it is an amazing privilege. And Beverly, you helped make that happen. Well, and, and we're going to have a big old international conference on queer studies, Black queer studies in particular, next year. And everybody who's listening should come. That's so, right. <laughs> why, Evelyn, do you think that there have been forces, some forces within our own communities, including mm -hmm. religious communities, that have been slow to defend black women and our knowledge, or maybe even quick to demonize. Mm. You know, I you know I think about this a lot, and I have for many years. I, I think a, a part of it is a kind of um, uh, a, a kind of way. Well, I guess the first thing that I think about is always uh, Darlene Clark 
Clark Hines' culture of dissemblance. Mm. That the forces that Black people have had to face throughout, you know, our history in this country have been deeply overwhelming, deeply traumatizing. And there are different ways that, that within our communities, people have struggled to try to just sort of, um, you know, sort of push back against certain kinds of, of power that certain kinds of, of, of attitudes, biases, structures of oppression, whatever language you want to use in this sense, um, to, 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 to not really acknowledge uh, how deep the, the, the destruction to people's psyches, to people's lived experience that has really happened. And I think that is part of the role that's in, in some instances uh, uh, religion has played. And also it's, a, it's also it's an attention to uh, kind of a, a, a desire for a certain kind of respectability that whites can grant if black people are, you know, sort of, you know, uh, accepted of, of certain attitudes that, that uh, white religious folks hold up. It's those kinds of things. I don't have a really good answer but I also am, I've been deeply troubled by the patriarchal structure of, of, of um, many black religious communities and denominations, um, the tendency to want to police our own, why, why? To, to, to create uh, the sense that, that um, the, the sort of ideas about deviance, inferiority, um, that are, are not innate to our people, that, that we are, you know, good, pe good people in quotes as well. It's, I think it's deeply, deeply complicated. Um, and it, it, it's, it's gonna take something, some, some real, I think, consistent pushing back on this um, um, resistance to coming to terms with um, certain issues um, which all to me really, really resonate around issues of, of um, gender and issues of, of, of queerness as, as, as much as we can see. And also who has the power and who serves, who's, who holds that power and, and what interests do they, they hold it for are the kinds of things that I think about. I don't have a good answer. And um, I, I just, I, but, but it's been deeply troubling um, and I think many people also fear, many people that I know fear loss of community if they mm -hmm. challenge an institution like the black church, um, that they won't, wh where are you gonna go then? If we don't have the church, what do we have? Um, and, but it's a, it's a, it has been a deeply troubling and um, in my view, certainly with respect to the treatment of black folks with HIV and AIDS has been a deeply disastrous approach to suffering of, of our people in our very own community. So that's what I'll say. Um, but I wish I had a better answer. That was a great answer. Mm -hmm. Kim, um, we know that the racial reckoning of 2020 provided the college board with the conditions of possibility for marketing their AP Black Studies course. But do students, you think, really know that the very contemporary subjects they're interested in studying have been excised from the course? And the many people who survived the purge of living authors are the likes of Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. You spoke earlier about the theory that holds African-American studies in terms of what it is. And so what specifically has been lost from the original version of the course from February, 2022, to the revision, which was released in February of 2023. Why does this betray the energy that took people to the streets in 2020? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we, we, we've, we've been talking about it, you know, in terms of the frameworks um, that have been excised in terms of the idea that, you know, uh, we can just give them letters and words without grammar and they'll still be able, you know, to, to create meaning when in fact the, the themes and the containers in which the uh, material is placed is what actually the educational value of the, of the course really is all about. Um, but I think, in fact, the, the telltale signs of what the College Board was up to um, are, are more... Uh, legible when you look at what they've actually taken out in terms of the objectives, right? right. So 
much of what um, made the course possible was a whole generation of students who were saying, we wanna understand why we've inherited this world, you know, 50 years after, you know, the civil rights movement, you know, 60 years after, after Brown, we're still um, experiencing uh, old, old style forms of racism and new, new forms. So what is it that we need to know? What is it that we can be exposed to, to better equip us to make the arguments necessary to create a better future? These were objectives that were initially put directly in the course objectives. Someone has gone in with, with like a surgical knife and cut out every aspect of contemporary and future relevance, right? So, you know, if, if you look from the very beginning, it says, you know, the point is for students to be become knowledgeable and aware of race and its intersections across the diaspora. They took and its intersections across the took it out. Right. Right. Uh, uh, they 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 should they should be able and 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 learn um, how to uh, understand uh, the, the the current world in order to create a better future. Took out understand the world to create a better future. So there's no mystery um, to how this course has been uh, put through a sieve and all of the things that were most relevant to the millions of people who were marching in 2020 have just gone down the drain. And what's left is basically a lot of stuff from ancient history and a lot of stuff um, from uh, um, history in the United States, but from like 1960 on, it, it's more or less, um, uh, uh, guest appearances uh, of people <laughs> like we just talked about, you know, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. meeting Bayard Rustin and, <laughs> you know, uh, meet Condoleezza Rice, but <laughs> no real analysis about what world these people occupied, the role in it, the frameworks that they use and the frameworks we can use uh, to understand it. So I, I really think the challenge right now, you know, I think about this like, you know, I'm gonna date myself, but we started uh, already with it. So I'm gonna go with it. Um, I remember when uh, black exploitation movies came out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were so starved to see black yes. people on screen. Yeah. <laughs> and we went to right. see that mess. <laughs> and we knew it was mess when we were in it. But it was black people a mess, right? At least we thought, right? right. And, and it was only after when you started realizing, oh, wait, these are white produced, white written, white, these are white people's ideas of black people. Um, most of them, some of them were, you know, some of them we did, but it was mess. And I think it was only when we started actually seeing, you know what, that's not the only option. There are other ways we can see ourselves on the screen and love what we see, uh, see the complexity of what we see. I remember when I saw, you know, uh, Julie Dash's film. First time I saw black woman being uh, beautifully portrayed and shot, Daughters of the Dust. You realize yes. what's possible. You realize what the point of black cinema can be. And then you get mm -hmm. mad at that crap that, that, that you spent good money to go see. We're gonna need a similar kind of recognition now that what we have is the opportunistic feeding of the desire to see ourselves in the curriculum. And so they're gonna give us whatever it is that's gonna fly in Florida or Texas. And I have to say, we don't even know if Florida, Texas, Virginia are even gonna accept the watered down version. So mm -hmm. they're throwing a whole lot for a right. bottom line, right? But the bottom line is that in the same way that we had to fight against the South being the lowest common denominator on what we as a people could accept, in terms of political participation, in terms of education, in terms of 
you know, uh, 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 public accommodation. We have to be willing to fight the same thing now. And for that to happen, A, we have to have real visions of what a real uh, Black Studies course looks like. So mm -hmm. all those teachers, the teachers in Philadelphia, the, the, the some of the teachers, the 5,000 that signed the last letter, we've got to be about doing the work of showing what a real Black Studies course is really about. We've got to be about right. doing the work of showing how the grammar of the different theories are what is what allows people to make sense of, of the facts. And we've got to insist that there's more for us than just a couple of biographies and some right. stuff that happened, you know, in, in ancient Egypt. That stuff is important, but it has to be put in conversation with the broader concepts and the themes that make it make sense to us in the here and now. We're going to take a very brief uh, pause here. I want to thank our wonderful panelists for this informative and lively dialogue. Before moving to our closing roundtable, I'm going to ask African American Policy Forum's Creative Arts Administrator, Awoye Tempe, Tempo, to come to us with a brief rundown about what we've been hearing online so far. Awoye. Thank you to everybody in the chat for such provocative and dynamic comments and questions. Uh, there have been a lot of incredible mic drop moments this during this conversation. So there's a lot of thanks from the audience for such a powerful conversation and also a lot of emotions you know the the anger from professor hammond's story about her brilliant idea for solar how how her idea for solar panels was received feelings of empowerment and clarity and curiosity about the professor's thoughts engaging technology feminist scholarship and historical frameworks People really responded to this notion of silence that Professor Cohen acknowledged and spoke to, and the power and disappointment of that deafening silence from allies is really being felt. Professor Crenshaw spoke about incomplete histories, and people are responding to the need to uplift these stories that are being erased, and also appreciating the very clear lens you all are providing to think about this moment when democracy is at stake. And Professor Crenshaw's call is really resonating as well. Do we have the determination and the commitment to tell a different story? One person quoted Bell Hooks in saying, quote, I saw in theory a location for healing, end quote. And that person continued to speak on what Black feminism and intersectionality were for them, saying it allowed them to understand their experiences and recognize how interlocking systems of oppression operate. And to that point, people are really holding on to that reminder about the power and resistance that comes from understanding Black feminism and intersectionality. One other person noted, quote, I can see the many ways in which the Anita Hill hearing set the pace for what we are experiencing in this moment, particularly how Clarence Thomas's record on the Supreme Court has negatively impacted our lives since then, end quote. And then a couple questions that have come up for the group are, one, how can we intentionally stand in solidarity with black women scholars and scholarship that are under attack? And two, how can we have proactive conversations with folks in our communities about this, especially the ones who don't recognize the harm of this erasure or are in agreement with it? So thank you so much, and I'll toss it back to Beverly. Thank you so much, Awoye. That's great. Uh, we're going to end with uh, three questions and then some concluding remarks. And I'm going to start with you, uh, Kathy. And the generic topic right now is what is to be done. So yes. Kathy, some people want to characterize all of what we've been talking about as an issue that only affects the supposedly elite world of academics and scholars but you have heavily been involved in activism surrounding and in the university. What do you think is the connection between knowledge production and mobilization? Why should we see universities as sites of struggle? And what have you been doing to fight back against this idea? Oh, there's a lot there. I'm gonna try to... <laughs> Uh, two minutes. Two, two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> Hurry up. Hurry up. So, so as the university is a site of struggle, I mean, I would, I would 
direct people to read Devarian Baldwin's uh, recent work where he kind of recoins the idea of university to universe cities. And in part, he's saying, if you take a university like the University of Chicago on the South side of Chicago, we're the largest employer on the South side. We provide the hedical, health care for folks on the South side, right? We sadly provide policing, the third largest police force in the state of Illinois, right? So while the university, of course, is about knowledge production, it's about so much more. And if we are committed, right, to the liberation of Black people, which I think we all are, then we have to be engaged in struggle. Engaged in struggle in terms of what we are learning, the language, in fact, that young activists who walk into our room will adopt to kind of analyze their own lived experience and will kind of take and translate back into movement spaces. I mean, part of what we have to really understand is in fact, the connection between liberatory ideas that are found in many of our classrooms and the work that we produce and the kind of liberatory mobilization that's happening in the streets, in community, right, across the country. There is a deep connection. But the thing I will say is I feel like we also have to reflect on why there isn't more outrage about what's happening. I think part of that is there has been a disconnection between the work that many scholars do in the academy and the lives that most Black people live, right? Mm -hmm. and there has to be a moment for us to reimagine and recommit mm -hmm. to connection, to making mm -hmm. sure that in fact Black communities understand and hold us accountable so that the work we're producing, of course, resonates with young people and hopefully young activists, but also speaks to the conditions of the communities that surround many of the, of the universities and colleges where we work, right? There just has to be a different way in which we are embedded in mobilization and struggle, right? That's focused clearly on the university, but that also speaks to the condition of Black people's lives. So at this moment, we, we are being called to do more to mobilize and to resist. And I, I'm hoping that many of us will, will um, respond to that. Mm -hmm. Hey, so Evelyn, we yes. saw a lot of focus around Black women's political power during the 2020 elections and the ways in which they were decisive in key states such as Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Why should we see the current attacks on Black women's knowledge production as connected to that moment? And what can we as Black women do right now as we move into and beyond the next electoral cycle? You know, I, I think one of the most uh, significant answers that I've heard from that question, to that question came from Sherilyn Eiffel, who used to be head of the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And she talked about the ways in which for, for the election of a Democrat into the White House, requires the votes of black women, right? We vote pretty much as a, we vote in many ways like a block, but what she noted about that is that we leave too much power on the table. If we made it possible for a Democrat to be president of the United States, we have to hold those people responsible uh, to us and our interests and our desires and our needs and how we want the society to change. And it seems to be a way in which uh, the Democrats can take us for granted take our votes for granted and then not respond to the issues we care about. And that is something that I think has to be made much more visible in our public discussions. I'm not just talking about, I mean, I'm not just trying to focus on electoral politics, but I think it's a good example. I mean, many other political, you know, um, uh, activities to me serve uh, broader and deeper um, uh, I think effectiveness in our society than electoral politics, but electoral politics are still really, really important. And I think that we just, we need to talk about these things. It has to be made more visible. And then once it's made visible, the, the real issue here is not just to get folks to vote, but to get folks, particularly uh, if we care about the issues related to bodily autonomy, uh, rights to abortion and healthcare, maternal health, all of these issues, then we have to speak out about that and continue to speak out about it until, and, and, and then move against those people who will not serve and support our interests. And um, a lot, I think the last thing I wanna say about this is too many other people are trying to tell our story. <laughs> and I think this is a real moment where 
We have to tell our story. We have to ex exercise the power we do have. And we have to hold those people who are not serving our interests. We have to hold them accountable. Kim, this letter, which mobilized thousands of folk from across the country and around the world to stand up against the assertion that our terminology, which we talked about earlier, has been so-called drained of value, was an important moment of organizing. But what comes next? I know that African American Policy Forum has been circulating information about an activism on May 3rd. But where do we go from here? Yeah. And, and Beverly, um, uh, um, we have to thank you uh, for, for being a mover and a, and a shaker behind that letter, basically saying that we're just you know, not going to take this uh, lying down. Um, and that's why over 5,000 people you know, have, have signed a, a, a letter that, that basically um, makes it clear that this is, this is asset stripping. This is basically um, uh, disenfranchising us. Um, it is uh, occupying uh, spaces that we have built. It is uh, basically taking um, our property, which is uh, the ideas that have come from uh, the struggles that we have engaged in, you know, for for over a century. So, um, uh, the the effort I think that the letter uh, has been able to um, uh, galvanize is a recognition that there is a critical mass of people um, who are as uh, determined not to let this happen uh, as earlier moments in, in our history where something galvanizing happened and people were able to focus uh, their energies on resisting this uh, particular um, pushback. And then that becomes part of a larger, broader movement. So May 3rd is an opportunity for anyone and everyone who feels a way uh, about what the college board has done, feels a way about anti-wokeness, feels a way um, about 40, uh, 45 plus states who have either passed or um, have uh, uh, in introduced legislation that tries to strip our future generations from knowledge about structural racism and, and intersectionality, black feminism and queer, uh, black queer studies, um, cognitive bias, all the things that help us understand our world in order to better transform it. What comes from that uh, really turns on um, how much people are, are, are prepared and willing to go to the mat to fight over our ability to speak, to fight over ideas, to fight over um, our right to name our reality. It, it's not the same as the lunch counters, but it functions like the lunch counters as the site um, of both our material oppression and um, the, the effort to make it normatively acceptable. This is not acceptable to us right. as a people and to us as a democracy. So our hope um, is that this gives people all over the country and frankly, people signed this letter from 54 countries mm -hmm. all over the world. Um, gives them a focal point, gives them people to connect with, gives organizations that have been in the streets and elsewhere uh, an ability to come together and say, look, if we can't talk about what's real, we can't transform it into something else. That, that's our hope. That's our goal. And I think, as, as Kathy said earlier, um, it is abundantly clear um, that those of us who are in these institutions um, need to make our work uh, more um, available, um, it need to lift up and um, provide what we can uh, to ongoing struggles. And it is also clear that we are under the same kind of pressures not to do that. The work that has been most targeted are the works that our critics say, well, that's just activism. Um, that's just an effort to change things. That's what Black 
intellectual production has always been about. So mm -hmm. we can't get caught up in this catch-22. We can't say, well, you know what? We get in trouble when we actually talk about you know, the killing of Black women. We can't say we get in trouble when we talk about uh, maternal mortality or we get in trouble when we talk about voter suppression. That's the good trouble that we're here for. And if we show up in the way that we need to show up, and if we show out in the way we need to show out, then we are doing everything we can to pass the baton on to the next generation. I'm not down for passing it to them in the condition it is now. So, you know, right. we got a few years before we, <laughs> before, you know, take our retirement. Yes. And I think it's our commitment to make sure that we pass on something that's in far better shape um, than what the college board has given us and what the broader environment has made possible. I can I just know, add uh, one piece uh, to that. Uh, can I add one piece to that? I also uh, think that as educators, um, you know, um, our work can get mischaracterized as, as activism in a, in a sort of in a negative sense. But as educators, we have to do what we know is the right thing to do with, and our students are asking for. Our students are saying this, how did we get here? How is it that, you know, you know the experiences I'm having, you know, in a predominantly white institution where people uh, make, you know, all kinds of racist and sexist and homophobic and transphobic kinds of comments around me all the time and nobody says anything about it. How did this situation emerge? How do they still have the power to do those kinds of things? When I was teaching uh, a, a course called Sick and Tired of Being Self Sick and Tired, Health Disparities in America, uh, right before COVID started, uh, well, I, I think COVID had pretty much started by then. And many of my students said, well, how are we going to change this? You know, is this the situation where Black people are now being targeted to, um, in terms of COVID, saying people were saying things like, well, that's, you know, Black people get different diseases, get more diseases than white people, and these kinds of things. And we, we talked about this in my class to the point where the students went out of that class and go, went down to public health department in Boston and got involved to try to say, why are so many Black people not being able to get the vaccinations? Why isn't there a good place for them to get those vaccinations in the largest Black community in Boston? So we, our work makes it possible for them to change the world and make a different future. If we can't say these things, if we can't give them the tools that they need, the analysis that intersectionality provides, then they can't change the world in the same way. Um, and they are asking for that. They're asking for us to help them make a better future. I have some concluding thoughts and I'm speaking for all of us uh, here at the end. We must remember as Barbara and Beverly Smith from the legendary Combahee River Collective wrote almost four decades ago about black feminism. And I'm quoting, there is no guarantee that our movement will survive long enough to become safely historical. We must document ourselves now. We mm -hmm. hope that our conversation tonight has done just that. <clears throat> I'd like to thank our panelists, Kimberly Crenshaw, Kathy Cohen, and Evelyn Hammonds for this engaging and thought provoking discussion. And thanks to all of the hard work and dedication from the marvelous team at AAPF. Lastly, a very special thanks to our audience for joining us tonight and hanging with us. We hope this conversation has elucidated the long trajectory of where we find ourselves now and what has yet to be done. We would like to keep this resolute energy going as we lead up to the Freedom to Learn National Day of Action on May 3rd. Now is the time to work to build a broad coalition of people to strengthen our democracy and our values of equity, inclusion, and social justice. Finally, as a close to her dream deferred 2023, the African American Policy Forum invites you to searching for harmony self-care as a sustaining practice in person this Friday, March 31 from 6 p.m. 
or at least starting at 6 p.m. at Columbia University, where Kimberly Crenshaw teaches. Please visit aapf.org for more information and registration details. Thank you very much and good night.